loneliness and say to you, sorry, imagine if the demon says to you, this life as you live it and have lived it, you will have to live it once more and innumerable times more. There will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything un unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees and even this moment and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again and you with it, speck of dust. Okay, so imagine that. Think about it. What would your reaction be to that thought experiment. He continues, would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you're a god and never have I heard anything more divine? If, uh, if, if that thought gained possession of you, you would change, it would change you as you are or at change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and everything, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Or, how well disposed you have to become to yourself and to life, to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal. Okay, so, this is a thought experiment that he's presenting. If, if a demon were to tell you that the life that you're living will be repeated over and over and over for all eternity in all of its detail, what would your reaction to that be? And he's obviously imagining two kind of extreme reactions. One is that this would be the most horrifying thing you could possibly imagine. You gnash your teeth and, and curse the demon. The other is that this is the most exhilarating and life-affirming thing that you could possibly imagine. So Nietzsche is sort of not noticing any, um, any uh, alternative between those extremes. Um, but what's he getting at? I mean, what's this supposed to be revealing about ourselves? Right? And so he's, he's assuming that your reaction to this thought would be one or the other. And what does that reveal about you? Okay, so the answer has something to do with what we've been talking about. Values. Yeah, what about what values? The way we're living our lives. Right, so the way we're living our lives uh, is either going to be such that this is an exhilarating and thrilling thought or it's going to be completely crushing. So which values lead to each of those actions? Really, I'm not asking so much about the values. I'm really asking about the metaphysical picture behind those values. Okay. If you live your life like just self-indulging yourself, like um, uh, stepping on people to get involved, and um, you're doing whatever you feel necessary to make your life better, and that just involves self-preservation, like fulfilling of one's needs, then you're probably going to view this in a way such as, oh, I would love to do that again. But I would kind of say, if you live your life selflessly, when you sacrifice and everything, and like in hopes that once you die, you'd be judged and given. That's the point. Right, so, so, so talking about uh, crushing other people or being self-interested, I don't think that that's actually what Nietzsche is worried about. The second point is exactly what he's worried about. Whether you're living your life in hope and anticipation of something else, like an afterlife, like you're having your reward in heaven. So if that's the basis, if that's the metaphysical picture underlying your values, this thought that there is no heaven, that this empirical world full of tears is the only world that there is, and you're going to live it over and over and over, that's going to be crushing. On the other hand, if you are living your life knowing that your life here on earth is the only life that there's going to be, 
and you are living your life in a way to affirm your existence in this mundane, empirical world, then living your life over and over again is going to be thrilling and affirming. Okay. So I want to say again that we don't yet have a picture of the content of these values, whether it involves crushing other people or being nice to other people. We're talking about the sort of metaphysical underpinnings of the system of values. Good. And one more thing about the gay science. At the very end, uh, he introduces this character, Zarathustra. Um, and this is a fictional character that Nietzsche um, introduces, based very loosely on the, what the Persian prophet who founded the Zoroastrian religion. Um, nobody knows really much about this guy, um, but um, that is when the historical Zoro, uh, Zarathustra lived. Um, our best estimate is about 1000 BC. Um, some claim it was much earlier, several thousand BC. But in any event, um, Nietzsche takes him as the founder of monotheism. So Zoroaster, so uh, Zarathustra, um, through the Zoroastrian religion, um, is the inventor of God, the inventor of uh, God. So our next book, then, is Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, this was published in four parts between 1883 and 1885. Um, it didn't sell um, in like many of his works. Um, it was um, circulated, the last part was circulated among his friends. Um, and he says that he wrote these um, the books of Zarathustra very quickly in sort of frenzied outbursts. Um, he had originally planned many more than just four parts, but um, eventually uh, abandoned the project. Okay, so in Zarathustra, um, we get a picture of this character who's portrayed as a kind of prophet um, and heralds the arrival of what he calls the Ubermensch and discusses the idea of the eternal recurrence that uh, we just talked about a moment ago. Um, this idea of the Ubermensch, um, it's something that, in my opinion, makes sense to leave untranslated. Um, just because sort of the more obvious translation I mean, literally is like over man. Um, the more obvious translation would be like Superman, um, but um, this is kind of absurd given the comic book character that was developed after. Um, and over man kind of doesn't make sense. It, maybe like higher man would be um, a more colloquial um, translation, but most commentators agree that it should not be interpreted as some kind of biological um, development. Uh, that's how it was originally interpreted, um, but Nietzsche explicitly rejects that in um, his later book. So all I want to say about this is that there's a subtle and complicated relationship between Nietzsche, the author, Zarathustra, the character, and the idea of an ubermensch, the idea of an, of an overman. So Zarathustra is not um, an ubermensch. He, he sort of looks forward to their creation. And we should not assume that everything Zarathustra says, Nietzsche believes. Um, in fact, Nietzsche clearly is using Zarathustra um, in sort of complicated, um, complicated uh, literary ways. Um, so all I'll say is that um, the Ubermensch seems to be the kind of person who will be able to affirm the eternal recurrence, 
So he's the kind of person who will be able to look at his own life in all of its details, sort of warts and all, and be able to affirm this life um, eternally uh, as something that will be um, uh, something that he would look forward to living over and over. Um, and so we might think of the idea of the Ubermensch as a kind of self-overcoming, not in the sense of eliminate denying, certainly not in the sense of denying, or even eliminating all of our weaknesses or faults, but in the sense of recognizing them through self-examination, through a clear-eyed, honest evaluation of ourselves, as I say, warts and all, faults and all, and using that knowledge of ourselves to create something of value. Um, okay. During the early 1880s uh, and into the mid-1880s, um, Nietzsche became more and more estranged from his sister, Elizabeth. Um, she was engaged and then eventually married, I think I mentioned this, uh, very prominent anti-Semite named Bernard Forster. Um, and Nietzsche and his sister had already quarreled over um, uh, the woman that Nietzsche had fallen in love with. Um, and he had become entangled in kind of a, a love triangle. Um, eventually, this led Nietzsche to split with his mother and sister um, for this woman who then promptly rejected him. Um, and so this period of his life was even more lonely and unhappy. Um, so I'll have a few more things to say about his, Nietzsche's <coughs> alleged anti-Semitism in a minute. Um, but here I want to quote um, from, just from two letters, um, you know, two private letters that he wrote concerning this. Um, so this one was from 1884 um, regarding his relationship with his sister, um, who was becoming more and more strange. Um, he wrote this. This is um, a handout from 1884. He says, meanwhile, the situation has been changed by my radical break with my sister. For heaven's sake, do not think that you should mediate between us and reconcile us. There can be no reconciliation between a vindictive anti-Semitic goose and me. He's referring to his sister. Um, and I want to read one more letter here. That's the last one in the handout. Um, this was um, to his sister a few years later in 1887. He says, one of the greatest stupidities you have committed for yourself and for me. Your association with an anti-Semitic chief expresses a foreignness to my whole way of life, which fills me ever again with ire or melancholy. It's a matter of honor to me to be absolutely clean and unequivocal regarding anti-Semitism, in case you didn't get the message, namely opposed as I am in my life. Um, okay, so as we'll see in the genealogy, um, he's a He's explicitly critical of anti-Semitism there, too. So how, you might ask, um, could he have been so badly misinterpreted? How could he be adopted by the Nazis as uh, a leading theorist? Well, one answer I've said a couple of times is simply through forgeries, um, that his sister forged letters and a diary um, that were made up. Um, but the other is more subtle. Because Nietzsche absolutely, as we've seen, is opposed to the moral system of values. Uh, and he associates, for reasons we'll see, uh, the moral system of values with the Judeo-Judeo.